I am aware that many object to the severity of my language. But is there not cause for severity? I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or to speak or write with moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of a ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen. But urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. We are here this evening to mark the passing of the Liberator. The last issue of the Liberator was printed on December 29, 1865. The Liberator was the preeminent abolitionist newspaper, and the career of its editor, publisher, prolific contributor, compositor, William Lloyd Garrison set the type for many of the issues of the Liberator. An all-around agitator for liberty, William Lloyd Garrison, um, is what we celebrate this evening. The Liberator exploded into the nation's consciousness in January 1831. Fear, panic, and universal hatred greeted its unknown 26-year-old editor. 34 years later, however, the city that had repudiated the paper and threatened the editor's life hailed both as part of the greatest force in United States history. This remarkable transformation reflected a contentious national process of public or collective memory formation and helped create an enduring legacy for the civil rights struggles of the next two generations. Not deeds, but William Lloyd Garrison's words exposed the nation's original sin. His unrelenting agitation compelled the country to face its ugly legacy. And his uncompromising determination set Americans on a path to emancipation. In his opening blast, he famously declared, I am aware that many object to the severity of my language. But is there not cause for severity? I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or to speak or write with moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of a ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen. But urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. The apathy of the people is enough to make every statue leap from its pedestal and to hasten the resurrection of the dead. To a calm, confident Boston, Garrison appeared like a hurling meteorite from another planet. Shock and outrage may be routine today, painfully routine, but in 1831, his white-hot words surged like an earthquake through those who learned what the scandalous editor had proposed. Instantly, they saw him as a dangerous threat, the most treacherous that Americans could imagine. With his future close friend and anti-slavery colleague, Reverend Samuel Joseph May, heard Garrison's first radical address in 1830, he turned to his brother-in-law, Amos Bronston Alcott, and said, this is a providential man. He will shake our nation to its center, but he will shake slavery out of it. While the Garrison phenomenon appears inevitable from the perspective of the 21st century, nothing could be further from the truth. His early life was actually a prescription for poverty and failure. Born on December 12, 1805 in Newburyport to Francis Maria Lloyd, a devout Baptist, his merchant sailor father, Abijah Garrison, soon plunged himself into alcohol and disappeared three years later, unable to tolerate his evangelical and uncompromising wife. A brother would follow his father to the sea, into alcoholism, and to an early death. 
His determined mother struggled to feed her family and eventually farmed out her children as apprentices. Young Lloyd failed at several crafts when his mother moved him to Baltimore, hoping for better prospects. He soon returned to Newburyport alone, barely a teenager. It would not see his mother again until 1823, just before her death. If not for her example, Garrison would have disappeared into the vapors of history. Fortuitously, in 1818, he received a seven-year apprenticeship as a writer and editor with the Newburyport Herald, which proved really fortuitous. He completed his apprenticeship in 1826, emerging as a highly skilled compositor, really one of the nation's best, an editor despite having precious little formal education. At 20, he borrowed money from his former employer to establish his own newspaper, the Newburyport Free Press, an organ for the Federalist Party, both nationally and statewide, an utterly dead political organization. <laughs> Within six months, Garrison had alienated his patron and lost all his readers. The paper folded. He moved on to Vermont and to Boston, where he became a printer and editor for the National Philanthropist, a temperance and reform newspaper. Garrison edited four newspapers before the Liberator. They all failed. <laughs> Impoverished, he appeared to all observers to be on the road to complete oblivion. His failures, however, proved instructive. Instead of falling to doubt or despair, which I would have, Garrison became more determined. He cultivated an identity as part of a, what he called a new race of editors men who envisioned a higher purpose for newspapers. Through journalism, he cast himself as an agent of moral reason, based on the integrity of conscience that aimed to, quote, attack the follies of the times and promote democratic ideals. He envisioned newspapers as a great engine of moral power, the most potent instrument that can be used in influencing the public mind, and if nothing else, William Lloyd Garrison wanted to influence the public mind. At first, he focused on temperance, a popular reform movement that bore no relationship at all to modern stereotypes. It offered critical roles for women and African Americans that attacked a very dangerous evil, would save lives and families, and potentially regenerate a stricken nation. When he moved to Boston in 1828, he encountered the evangelicalism of Lyman Beecher. Thus, the model of religiosity and drive embodied by his mother blended with the nation's pervasive second great awakening, his own relentless ambition to rise, and his innovative journalism to create in him a sweeping desire for the Christian regeneration of America. Despite all his, his failures, even er he firmly and perhaps arrogantly asserted, my name will one day be known to the world. One can readily see in his developing approach to journalism and reform this unique combination of intolerance, righteousness, and vision that would be the hallmark of his career. In March of 1828, he met the peripatetic Quaker abolitionist and editor, Benjamin Lundy, who was a kind of model for him, and experienced an evangelical-like conversion that set him on his future course. In Lundy, Garrison uh, believed he had met, these are his words, one of those rare spirits that rise up in the lapse of many centuries. Why Lundy, who was a moderate uh, anti-slavery gradualist, had such an impact on Garrison is not entirely clear. Likely, he saw in him uh, all the elements that underpinned his own developing career and sense of Christian mission, which he instantly applied to a wrong which he probably never thought much about before. With Beecher's words ringing in his ears, the revelation that slavery was a sin and thus must be immediately abandoned likely sparked a sense of shame that he hadn't recognized this monumental sin on his own. Forever after, as he later confessed, I never rise to address a colored audience without feeling ashamed of my own color, ashamed of being identified with a race of men who have done you so much injustice. One of Garrison's eulogists captured the really fearsome nature of the mission that this determined editor had set for himself. One boy against a score of millions of men and women, 
against the state, against the church, against the press, against the pulpit. He saw the prophet's vision and heard the word of God calling him to duty. Given the North's racist underpinnings and the South's irreversible commitment to the institution of slavery, it took an almost willing sense of martyrdom to assume such a role. As he once proclaimed, who would not die a martyr to such a cause? Well, he did not desire martyrdom, but he certainly tempted it as the forces that his radical abolitionism unleashed proved perilous, even murderous. You son of a bitch. If you ever send such papers here again, we will come and give you a good lynching. So you had better keep them at home. Such was a typical letter the Liberator's editor received from South Carolina in 1839. Another, from Virginia, advised the dangerous editor to remain in Boston and preach your doctrines, but coward-like, be afraid to open your mouth elsewhere. Several southern states put a price on Garrison's head, especially since the Liberator appeared the same year as the Nat Turner Rebellion, although Nat Turner clearly had no way to know about his newspaper. In response, the growing furor surrounding Garrison and his colleagues led Massachusetts Governor Edward Everett to, to, to declare excuse me, that every good citizen had a duty to avoid discussing slavery. Such debate, he warned, would prove the rock upon which the Union will split. He then called upon the state legislature to determine if abolitionists could be arrested. In 1835, when the English abolitionist George Thompson arrived in Boston to support the growing American anti-slavery movement, 5,000 of the city's most respectable citizens formed a mob, ransacked the Liberator's office, seized Garrison, threw a rope around him, and would have lynched the fiery editor if the mayor had not jailed him for his own protection and to lock the jails back in the back. The attempted lynching of Garrison was only one of over 150 similar events that occurred between 1833 and 1859. But no other incident created more controversy and ironically more abolitionists than the 1837 murder of Elijah P. Lovejoy, the anti-slavery editor of Alton, Illinois, who was murdered defending his press. Nevertheless, to the overwhelming number of Americans, the abolitionists' insistence that the nation immediately emancipate its slave represented, as the New York Herald declared in 1850, dangerous assemblies calculated for mischief and are treasonable in their character and purposes. The repression of the abolitionists, however, had the effect of increasing support for the anti-slavery movement, enlarging the liberator's subscription list, and creating sympathy among those who may not have really agreed with Garrison so much, but liked the attack on free speech and civil liberties even less. It also made Garrison a hero to nearly every African American in the North, a group that proved essential, absolutely essential to the liberator's survival in its first years. The paper had only 50 white subscribers. African Americans like the wealthy Philadelphian James Fortin provided the paper's financial support, while countless others served as distribution agents, even supplied the facts and much of the content of the paper in its first years. As Garrison himself proudly confessed, the Liberator belongs emphatically to the people of color. It is their organ. Lindsay Swift, one of, the, one of Garrison's early biographers, recognized him as the first American agitator. Now this signifies more than just a disturber of, of the peace. As Wendell Phillips recognized, Garrison filled a vital role in the structure of the nation's political culture. Phillips, who knew his Alexis de Tocqueville all too well, realized that Garrison challenged the tyranny of the majority. And in his role as agitator, he represented the only mechanism that addressed democracy's central weakness. Agitators like Garrison became critical to the machinery of state, bearing prime responsibility for, as Phillips said, reawakening the people to great ideas that are constantly fading from their minds. Citizens tended to become dangerously complacent about government, Phillips wrote. 
often seeing it as a mechanism that would go of itself. The republic which sinks to sleep, he warned, trusting to constitution and machinery, to politicians and statesmen for the safety of its liberties, never will have any. Clearly, a republic could, dem could democratically settle on tyranny. Indeed, it already had settled on the worst of tyrannies. Thus, as Phillips explained, the people are to be awakened to a new effort, just as the church has to be regenerated in each age. Agitation is a necessity of each age, he counseled, to promote faithful vigilance so constantly in danger of sleep. This role would really mean nothing without a free press, the great equalizer, key to the agitator's success and a republic's survival. The day was, Phillips explained, before gunpowder, when the noble clad in steel was a match for a thousand. Gunpowder leveled peasant and prince. The printing press has done the same. Thus, as Garrison understood, the agitator needed a free press to guide opinion and force change. Newspapers like the Liberator, or in today's world, the electronic media, shape public opinion and determine the course of events. The man, Phillips declared, who launches a sound argument, who sets on two feet a startling fact, is just as certain that in the end, he will change the government. Garrison was that man. To Phillips, Wendell Phillips had inaugurated a vast revolution, which, in his words, is without parallel in history since, since Luther. Abolitionists certainly existed before Garrison, but he was the first man to begin a movement designed to annihilate slavery. In one of his more profound insights, Phillips observed that Garrison's words had turned every single home, press, pulpit, and Senate chamber into a debating society with his right and wrong for the subject. And as was said of Luther, God honored him by making all the worst men his enemies. <laughs> Current scholarship veers dangerously close to losing sight of Garrison's importance in the years leading up to the Civil War, indeed of the entire anti-slavery movement. Today, with our toxic and irreconcilable political chisms, excuse me, constantly before us, reminiscent of the 1850s, this shift away from Garrison is perhaps understandable. Anti-slavery scholarship has not abandoned the sympathetic trends initiated oh, 40, over 40 years ago, especially regarding African Americans and women, and women. But one can see disturbing trends that question anti-slavery and reform motivation and refocuses attention from the abolitionists and toward traditional political figures, especially Abraham Lincoln and Republican Party leaders. Returning to this pre-1960s trend, some scholars are asserting that politics and political ideology alone account for sectional strife and the death of slavery. Moreover, in our own age of terrorism, Scholars are casting abolitionists, especially John Brown, as dangerous religious fanatics. That word appears over and over again. Uh, in fact, in last Sunday's uh, Boston Globe, John Brown in the travel section was referred to um, as, a, uh, as a fanatic. Uh, so it, it, hasn't, it hasn't left. Uh, actually, the word used was rabid. You think of rabbit, you know, it's, it's a, the skunk you see out at night or during the day foaming at the mouth. Fortunately, however, we have the record of men like Wendell Phillips to remind us that anti-slavery <clears throat> anti agitation created the constituencies that empowered the politician, gave them their vo votes, got them their offices, furnished them their facts, and gave them their audience. In short, as Wendell Phillips said, Garrison made Lincoln possible. Lincoln himself may have confirmed this view. He invited Garrison to the White House in 1864, and the president may have told him how important the agitator was to ending slavery. At least his daughter thought so. Also, the Garrison family believed that Lincoln had told a Union officer that he saw himself as only an instrument in the campaign against slavery. 
the logic and moral powers of garrison, Lincoln allegedly confessed, and the anti-slavery people of the country and the army had done it all. Family legend, well, perhaps so. But we do have the words of the slaves themselves. When Garrison visited Charleston, South, Carol excuse me, South Carolina, for the official flag raising uh, in the recaptured Fort Sumter, 10,000 former slaves escorted him through the streets. When he spoke at Charleston's Zion Church, he was introduced by a former slave who said, now, sir, through your labors and those of your noble coadjutors, these, pointing to his two daughters, are mine. No man can take them from me. The way Americans have understood Garrison and the abolitionists has changed over time. Indeed, changed during Garrison's own lifetime. Still, from 1830, really, to the present day, they have a reputation as troublemakers, fanatics, and hotheads. Even as late as 1998, when Henry, Henry Mayer published his, the most recent full biography of Garrison, he was still referred to as a fanatic. Even Garrison's own daughter, Fanny Garrison Villard, called her father a hothead and said that as a child in winter months, she used to warm her hands on what she called his bald incendiary head. More seriously, in the history of what historians call public or collective memory, how the culture has understood Garrison and the abolitionists has varied with the changing climate of opinion. While memory of the movement has never disappeared, it has been recollected very differently over the last 150 years. And memory of the movement's prominent members has fluctuated wildly. Because from the, the beginning, Garrison has been identified as the movement's founder, and because he was so vilified and then celebrated, memory of him has endured to the present, while individuals like Wendell Phillips, who for 50 years after his death in 1884, enjoyed a far more vibrant legacy than Garrison, is now completely forgotten even in his home of Boston. Garrison remains widely known, if not always correctly understood. In part, this is because of the many biographical studies of him that have appeared since 1877, two years before his death. Even when academics damned Garrison and the anti-slavery movement as the cause of the Civil War, he still attracted a host of sympathetic biographers, although most of them were in ac academics. There are, in print, 34 Garrison biographical studies. Seven aimed just at juvenile readers, one that has appeared in Tamil and another in Gujarati. And one, to borrow from the sport of professional cycling, is beyond category, William Denton's 1882, Garrison in Heaven, a Dream. <laughs> the most recent scholarly study was published just last year, focusing on his founding of the Liberator. It's really an extraordinary record, testifying to Garrison's importance, but such facts tell us very little about how Garrison was remembered, who remembered him, and what purposes such memory played in the larger culture. Public or collective memory embraces the work of historians, but more expansively includes the efforts of groups, even nations, to construct usable versions of the past to create self-understanding, identity, and to win power in this ever-changing present. Memory of the past has less to do with thinking about the past as it does thinking with it. It is a process of remembering and forgetting, a struggle over how our understanding of what came before becomes part of the present and an instrument of power. In short, what gets remembered and forgotten matters, revealing society's malleable and contending values and priorities. Thus, we can see how once the Civil War concluded and the institution of slavery had ended, the city that nearly lynched William Lloyd Garrison could largely forget its own actions and hail him as a hero. His condemnations of the Union, the denunciations of the North's complicity with slavery, and the hatred such criticism, in, criticism engendered vanished like frost in the flood of sunshine. The war and slavery's demise changed everything, including memory. 
making it cohere into a new collective memory that better served what one analyst called our ideas of the moment. In some way, the public response to Garrison after 1865 represented an admission, even if temporary, that the abolitionists had been right, and the city and much of the North wanted to lay claim to that legacy which gave their own sacrifices a more transcendent meaning. Garrison himself played a critical role in creating the legend that became critical to future reformers. In a very contentious move, he insisted that the Liberator and the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society end with the demise of slavery. Adoption of the 13th Amendment to him formally brought to close a long and very difficult career and the gravest of sins. To me, Garrison remarked, it is something like the translation from death to life. Now a hero, he became reborn, and that image became fused to the reality of emancipation. As he proclaimed in the final issue of The Liberator, the extermination of chattel slavery has been gloriously consummated. Even his longtime assistant, the black historian William C. Nell, joined in Garrison's move, celebrating the paper's end as confirmation of slavery's demise and proclaiming it the official record of the anti-slavery movement. The decision had dramatic consequences, freezing public memory of Garrison in a victory narrative, his ideals and principles intact, even if that was not entirely true. But in contrast to the legend, he continued the struggle. It didn't end in 1865. And this is far from understood since all his biographers ignore the post-Civil War period in Garrison's life. Although he continued his agitation, um, he even wrote a hundred essays just for Theodore Tilton's journal, The Independent. And one of his last acts in 1879, the year he died, was to denounce the nation's Chinese immigration policies. Sound familiar? Even the languid Olin Warren statue of him on Commonwealth Avenue, raised in 1886, bows to Garrison's and his family's desire to immortalize him, not as a young agitator, but in 1865, the moment of his career's consummation, merging catharsis with ecstasy. His death became more than a time for mourning. In the months leading up to his death, the nation's journalists carefully monitored his declining health, as one would a celebrity, which is what he had become. Southern newspapers, if they mentioned him at all, and they didn't very much, uh, did so with derision, damning him as the greatest force preventing national reconciliation. Garrison sees no South. He knows no South but the Negroes. The Caucasian race are trash in the eyes of this crazy radical. In a milder vein, the Wheeling, West Virginia Register thought he had died a long time ago. What? He's alive? <laughs> and labeled him a man who was unreasonable, who had unreasonable and excessive views, who would be missed only by people who knew him. Elsewhere, the newspapers that had damned him in life, such as the Boston Daily Advertiser, now praised him in memory as one of the most distinguished of Americans. I mean, it was just incomprehensible in the 1830s. Although it still rejected his disunionism and considered political abolitionists like Sumner, who believed in the Constitution as a charter of freedom, were better heroes. Nearly everyone, however, really nearly everyone who commented on, on um, Garrison's passing, commented on the changed public attitude toward him. Once seen as a hot-brained reformer and troublemaker, now from Boston to Portland, Oregon, most of the public viewed him as heroic, the force behind emancipation, the conscience of the country, and in a phrase that appears over and over again, the apostle of freedom. His surviving former colleagues like Oliver Johnson and Wendell Phillips used his passing as an opportunity to rivet his memory to the Civil War's achievement of emancipation and to justice for African Americans, especially in the South. The year after Garrison's death, Phillips toured the North, lecturing in places where back in 1861 he had been mobbed. He now lectured about Garrison to these enthusiastic audiences, proclaiming Garrison one of the few great men of the world. Others attempted to preserve a heroic and safe version of Garrison by distancing him from those like John Brown, who had turned to the gun. 
Garrison's one weapon was discussion, another memorialist remarked, not violence. And that was true. No group of Americans, however, could match the sustained honor Ameri African Americans paid to the Bostonian. From the moment of his passing to well into the 20th century, black Americans saw in Garrison our foremost champion. From Massachusetts to Oregon and south to Louisiana, African American communities marked Garrison's passing with profound appreciation, sadness, and not a little fear. They staged memorial services in virtually every black community. As the morning Oregonian remarked, erecting a monument of undying gratitude in our hearts for his great services to our race. Uh, another newspaper, the People's Advocate in Washington, D.C., called upon their brethren to turn National Emancipation Day, Juneteenth, into a service for this fallen hero. In New Orleans, African Americans recognized his whole career from 1830 until the day he died, praising his work to end slavery and establish freedom as a divine right. They also praised his continued work on their behalf, condemning the suppression of black rights in the South and their forced flight into the West. They rightly felt a sense of loss at the number of friends time was stripping away. People they and the democracy needed as much in 1880 as in 1830. Boston blacks packed the Phillips Street Baptist Church in a memorial service and pledged to never forget and teach our children gratefully to remember the one man more than any other responsible for their liberty. Across the country, African Americans named their social and cultural organizations after him, saving societies, literary groups, young people's cultural associations, Freemason and other fraternal orders, GAR posts, Grand Army of the Republic, elementary schools here in Boston, Washington, D.C., Kansas City, all bore Garrison's name in recognition of his work and as inspiration for future generations. They understood, as the black Chicago paper, the broad, the broad Axe, I love that name, explained, if not for the abstract eloquence of Charles Sumner, Wendell Phillips, William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, and Horace Greeley, and hundreds of other liberty-loving men and women, the black flag of slavery would still be waving over millions of bondsmen. African Americans had more than gratitude in mind. By the time of Garrison's death in 1879, the gains of Reconstruction were slipping away. Reconstruction itself had become a repugnant term to whites in the North. Moreover, insistence on Southern black rights appeared to stand in the way of national reconciliation and reunification. As early as 1872, E.L. Godkin, the flinty editor of The Nation, one of the North's most liberal journals still publishing, concluded that Reconstruction had become, and these are Godkin's words, morally a more disastrous process than rebellion. In 1877, he rejoiced in the compromise that put the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes in the White House and peace in the South. No more, he sighed, and it's maybe a, an intended pun, would the nation be troubled with the Negro. The nation will have nothing more to do with him. The emancipationist vision of the war that Boston still celebrated had come under sustained attack throughout the country. As the Baltimore African American a little later remarked, today the South is in the saddle, and with the single exception of slavery, everything it fought for during the days of the Civil War, it has gained by repression of the Negro within its borders. Some former abolitionists even concluded that Southerners had been right all along. Blacks could not successfully live in freedom. Mark Twain's own colleague, Charles Dudley Warner, asserted that blacks remained too ignorant to vote and thus Southern whites knew best and should be, and these are his words, permitted to manage their blacks. Even the former abolitionist leader like Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who takes a back seat to no other abolitionist, published an unflattering account of Garrison admitting to his importance but characterizing him as unreasonable, overzealous, intolerant, whose rigidity chased away as many as it attracted. 
Worse yet, the children of Garrison's former enemies, like the Reverend Leonard Bacon, who was a colonizationist, published scathing indictments of Garrison. In 1903, Bacon's son, same name, Leonard Bacon, asserted that more than anyone, Garrison bore responsibility for bringing on the horrors of the Civil War. And then he went on to denounce all of Garrison's eulogists as liars. That's his word. The memory of Garrison as the apostle of freedom assumed a central role in the war against this pervasive neo-Confederate view of the abolitionists, the Civil War, and the rising Jim Crow culture, which had transformed even scholarly understanding of abolitionism. <clears throat> in a horrifying 1941 assessment, Frank Owsley, who was a Vanderbilt historian and who was president of the Southern Historical Association, wrote off the abolitionist movement as, and these are all his words, a crusade against the Southern people. He declared, um, Owsley, he declared that neither Dr. Goebbels nor Virginia Guida nor Stalin's propaganda agents have as yet been able to plumb the depths of vulgarity and obscenity reached and maintained by George Bourne, Stephen Foster, Wendell Phillips, Charles Sumner, and other abolitionists of note. That's what the academic profession was like at, from about 1920 until about 1950. African Americans needed Garrison's legacy for their fight for racial justice. As the colored American explained in 1899, the Garrison name symbolizes liberty, liberty for all mankind. The New York activist and editor, T. Thomas Fortune, employed the Garrison name to attack the Democratic Party of his age, of his period, damning it in the 1890s as a party of the South, just as it had been in the 1840s. As African Americans in Kansas recognized, the Garrison name was essential to combat the enormity of the present evil of Negro American serfdom. In 1905, when organizing the Garrison centenary, Boston blacks called for what they called a second Garrisonian movement. W.E.B. Du Bois, who saw Garrison as a man of indomitable courage, and later used the Liberator as a model for his for the NAACP's official journal, The Crisis, answered that call. That same year, 1905, he organized the Niagara Movement, predecessor of the NAACP, and he required everyone who joined to take what he called the Garrison Pledge. This is the opening part of that pledge. Bowing in memory of that great and good man, William Lloyd Garrison, I, a member of the race for whom he worked and in whom he believed, do consecrate myself to the realization of that great ideal of human liberty which ever guided and inspired him. I hereby pledge myself to fight for freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom to vote, freedom to enjoy public conve conveyances, and freedom to associate. In 1905, the Garrison Centenary events, which was actually first advocated by Booker T. Washington, took place in African-American communities across the country. Kansas activists proclaimed that Garrison had summoned the Republican Party into existence, elected Abraham Lincoln president, set Grant to Richmond, Sherman to the sea, and Sheridan down the Shenandoah. He wrote the Emancipation Proclamation and added the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. He did these things because he set in motion the agitation which resulted in these glorious achievements. Boston African Americans, led by Washington's enemy, William Monroe Trotter, allied with surviving abolitionists, the Garrison family, who at that point was allied with Booker T. Washington, and other neo-abolitionists to stage a massive two-day celebration here in Boston. Trotter, who uh, was editor of The Guardian, saw himself as a modern-day garrison. He even kept a bust of him on his roll-top desk and established his newspaper in the same offices where Garrison published The Liberator. One of his black colleagues even characterized him as being an un as uncompromising as William Lloyd Garrison, which in Trotter's case was not an asset. Sparked by headlines that cried, Garrison's work as yet undone, Every African American in the region who could walk attended the many events in the Boston area. 
at Fannell Hall, they heard the editor and AME uh, bishop, Reverdy C. Ransom, declare Garrison's legacy, and these are his words, as cherished, not only in America, but around the world. Wherever men aspire to individual liberty and personal freedom, he stood for righteousness. He put manhood above money, humanity above race, the justice of God above the justices of the Supreme Court, and conscience above the Constitution. With freedom under attack, more fiercely in 1905 than in any day since the 1850s, Garrison had a message for the present. At the Joy Street Church, which in 1905 had become a synagogue, Moorfield's story used Garrison as a reminder of how much could be accomplished in, and his, or, this is Story's words, in a good cause by courage, persistence, un, and unwavering devotion. Let us persevere in the path which Garrison opened for us until every man has an equal opportunity, unfettered by law and unhampered by prejudice. The Garrison centenary became a launching pad for greater civil rights activism. In fact, it created a second Garrisonian movement. We know it as the Civil Rights Movement. It helped coalesce organized resistance to the accommodationist policies of Booker T. Washington, eventually giving rise to the NAACP. As Reverend e. Ransom advised his brethren at Frannell Hall, we should not stoop to conquer. In time, neo-abolitionists like Francis Jackson Garrison William Lloyd Garrison Jr. and their sister Fanny Garrison Villard played critical roles in wedding their father's legacy to the growing militancy and refusal to accept racial subordination. They had been joined earlier by radicals like Henry George and Henry Demarest Lloyd, and then by the great activist and lawyer Moorfield Story and many others. As late as 1956, one can see in black newspapers employing uh, the quotes from Garrison's first editorial to, that I read at the beginning, of course, and to fortify the civil rights movement. Even the passive, passive resistance strategy of Martin Luther King Jr. in part came to him after reading Gandhi, who had read his, real, his Leo Tolstoy, who had read his William Lloyd Garrison. In 2005, and the Excuse me, in the 2005 Garrison Bicentennial here in Boston, Yale historian David Blight asked what Garrison and abolitionism means for the 21st century. As has been the case since 1879, that will be for us to decide. Thank you. If political power isn't willing to protect European Jews against minority movements that legitimize themselves by making explicitly anti-Semitic arguments, no one is going to protect them.